The film you've just seen depicts very clearly the very important role that Alfred Wegener had in the development of the theory of continental drift in the early part of this, this century. The theory of continental drift is now part of the history of geology insofar as it's been superseded by plate tectonics. Continental drift really treated only the continents as pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, but now plate tectonics treats the whole of the Earth's crust, the oceans, and the continents as pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. So the uh, program today, looking at continental drift, is in a sense a flashback to part of the development of a current theory. One of the important events of the 1960s, which stimulated again attention to continental drift, was a meeting in London. I was fortunate enough to be a graduate student in London in 1964 when the meeting was held at the Royal Society, and the result of that meeting was this volume, a volume of papers by those who were adherents of the theory of continental drift and also some by those who weren't, and particularly some quite vigorous discussion by those who were in favor of the stability and the permanence of the continents and the oceans at that time. This is one of the maps that was produced showing the fit of the continents, uh, a map produced by some Cambridge geologists. It's interesting to reflect on the tremendous change that's taken place in geology in the last 11 years. Um, <clears throat> that map, which was produced by the Cambridge geologists, was a map of the fitting of the continents, particularly of South America and of Africa. It wasn't the first time that an attempt had been made to match those two continents. It was first suggested by Bacon in si the 16th, 1600s, and was repeated again in the uh, 19th century by Antonio Schneider, who produced some geological evidence, the matching of fossils across these two continents. In fact, plants from the uh, Pennsylvanian system. But unfortunately, this was the only scientific argument which Snyder put forward in support of his matching of the continents. He felt that the split had taken place during the time of Noah's flood, and this mixture of geology and theology didn't win him many supporters in the scientific world. Even Wegener, 50 years later, who was the first and this was Wegener's great contribution, the first to marshal scientific arguments from many areas, from climatology and paleontology and geology, the matching of strata from continent to continent. Even then, Wegener had a hard time because he was unable to propose a mechanism. One of the things that Wegener was able to do was to produce a pretty good match of the continents. But the match which was produced in the 1960s was a computer match and was very much more accurate. It wasn't just based on I, although the I is a very good instrument for making comparisons of this kind. The computer was able to fit these two continents together with an accuracy of 99%. The average overlap or the average gap was about 90 kilometers, which isn't very much when you consider the size of these two continents. Now, you remember from earlier units that the edge of the continent and the edge that was used to, uh, to match these two continents is not the coastline. The coastlines are marked here in black. The edge of the continent was taken by these Cambridge geologists as the 500 fathom line. In other words, 3,000 feet or 1,000 meters. And that was taken as a true edge of the continent. There are some areas of overlap and some gaps, as I mentioned. One of the areas of overlap is in fact up here. And that's where the Niger River flows into the South Atlantic, at about this point. And the Niger River has built itself a delta, a delta of sand and mud, which has crossed the continental shelf, which is very narrow there, and built out and produced a protuberance, or a wart, if you like, on the 3,000 foot line, on the 500 fathom line that was used to match the continents. And it's for that reason that this overlap is here. Some of these small gaps can also be filled, or if not filled, at least made a little narrower, by looking around for islands, very small islands, of continental rock, of granitic rock, which are now in the ocean, the South Atlantic, 
which divides these two continents. Now, one of the people attending that conference, a gentleman called Hurley, a geologist called Hurley from America, um, <clears throat> from, I think, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, in fact, went back to his laboratory and reasoned, quite obviously, that if these two continents fit that well, then the geology ought to match from one to the other. The rocks ought to be identical, and they ought to fit, fit together like the, the pattern on a jigsaw puzzle, or like the newsprint that you saw being torn in the, in the film. And the particular rocks that he looked at, that Hurley looked at, were cratons, areas of very, very old rock. Areas of rock 2,000 million years old and older. There's an area of that kind in Brazil, and one can see the perimeter of that, that area. Um, <clears throat> rocks 2,000 million years old, surrounded by other rocks 600 million years old. Hurley found similar cratons in Africa, in particular. He found one here, and there, nearly all of the perimeter of that body of old rock was visible. But it came to an end at the coastline of Africa. So Hurley reasoned that if Africa and South America were once joined, it ought to be possible to find the continuation of that craton in South America. So he went over, and in fact, right here is a tiny little area of very, very old rock. 2,000 million year old rock, surrounded by 600 million year old rock, just as on the opposite coast. He tested this again with another craton, this time again the main body of the craton was in Africa, but a small part of it was once again traceable in South America. And from that kind of geological evidence, the kind of matching of the geological uh, strata, ages of rock and kind of rock, across the coastlines came the conviction that fitting together the continents like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle was a very good way to get some idea of the way the continents might have once been joined. And it was as a result of that that further continents, in this case here, India and Antarctica, Fit that a little better. And Australia, we have to move our continents a little here. Not quite as easily done as the computer did it, but nevertheless, computer fits of the other continents in the southern hemisphere of Antarctica, Australia, and India produced not too bad a pattern, particularly not too bad when you remember that islands like Madagascar would fill up this hole rather nicely. And the Seychelles are also islands of continental crust which fill up some of these gaps. This major gap here, which was a, a source of some concern and would be, I'm sure, to you looking at it, that's a very obvious gap, that gap is produced because the deformation of this part of Antarctica is quite recent and was probably produced after the continents broke away and therefore the shape at the time that the continents were joined may well have been much more similar to the shape that's necessary to match this coastline. So that's a bit of deformation after the movement away of the, the continents. And similarly one can explain some others of these small gaps down here. Now, not to be outdone by the uh, geologists of the southern hemisphere, the geologists of the northern hemisphere also had a shot at fitting together their continents. Let's take these off. <clears throat> 